How you can make the word of God flesh to you. In Psalm 118, <clears throat> excuse me, again, the message today is Palm Sunday story. The faithfulness of God. Psalm 118, let's look at verse 25. It says, Blessed, I will save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Verse 20 says, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Now, so this point here is, is that here is a statement made, and of course, there is that description that we just read there in Matthew chapter 21. Let's go back to that, and let's look at precisely verse 5, <clears throat> where uh, and it says, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, Let's go to several places in, in the Old Testament. I just wanted to show you that when God makes a declaration, that declaration will have to be fulfilled, right? Amen. And so he made a declaration through the prophet. Let's go to, uh, first of all, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. You see that he says, Let's read it together. Ready, read. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the full of an ass. Isn't it amazing that the very description that, will, that described what the Messiah would do when he showed up is exactly what Jesus did. Amen. Did you get it? Amen. I mean, they were declaring that he is the one that they should sing Hosanna to. Now, I, I like something that uh, I will show you in a minute that was said about this incident. And you will find out that this time period coincides with when Jesus was born, in terms of what was said by, by the angel, let's look at Luke chapter 2 quickly, and I'll give you all this scripture and I'll tie it together because I want to make sure that you see how great God is when it comes to fulfilling his word to the letter. I mean, it, it amazes me to read the Old Testament, and these are different prophets, different people who were centuries apart. And they will prophesy about something, say what God said about something, and then somebody else will come afterward and, and confirm that which was said several centuries ago. We read what Zechariah said about this Messiah, what he would do, and then Matthew will find out several centuries later that Jesus will come and fulfill the very thing that was said. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, so look with me to, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> and we're going to look at two places here. In fact, yeah, go to, put in something that Luke 19, we'll come to that in a minute. Go to Luke chapter 2. And let's look at what was said about Jesus when he was born. In Luke chapter 2, let's look at verse 14. Luke 2, 14. It says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, what? Peace, goodwill toward men. And so when Jesus was born, the angels sang and declared, that there will be on earth, what? Peace. And then fast forward. This is so remarkable. 
when our fathers are, when are studying, go to Luke chapter 19. And this is Luke's account of what we read in Matthew chapter 21. And in verse 38, verse 38, it reads, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Now, when Jesus came, when he was born, they said, on earth, peace. And now that he is about to die for you and I, they say, in peace, where? In heaven. And glory in the highest. That makes you want to ask yourself the question, why, did, why does heaven need peace? Well, what will make heaven need peace? Is it a good question? Because they're declaring that because this very scripture is being fulfilled in the person of Jesus on, on, on this Palm Sunday, that, that indeed there is peace in heaven. Now come with me. Let's go to Hebrews and find out why this would be, uh, the, be necessary. You know, um, uh, and what I'm saying, why would this be necessary is that why will even heaven need to have this peace? Because you would think that you wouldn't need in heaven any harmony or peace because heaven is, there's harmony there. There's no question about that. We know that. But something that happened on earth affected heaven. I just want you to understand that. Okay, are you there in Hebrews chapter 9? Are you there? Let's pick up from verse 11. We're going to read quite a few here. Hebrews chapter 9 verse, But Christ being come, an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Next. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, by his own blood, by his own blood, by his own blood, he entered into the holy place. Ask yourself the question, why does he have to take blood into the holy place? You see the peace in heaven? Having obtained eternal redemption for us. So something that happened on earth required that. This is the reason why when Jesus resurrected and uh, Mary wanted to touch him, he said to her, no, don't touch me yet. You remember that? He says, I go to my father and your father and my God and your God. Because he had to go and present his precious blood into the holy place to obtain eternal, I don't mean partial, I don't mean a decade, I don't, it means eternal redemption for us. Are you listening to me? So something happened to make this, and, and when I read it, it's a peace in heaven. On the day that Jesus uh, uh, sat on the colt and they were announcing and declaring Hosanna in the highest peace in heaven. And all the, they, they were saying something that had already been decreed, declared by God will happen. Because this very scripture we read here, was, was, it was necessary that Jesus make that. You see why there was no way that any human being could have achieved eternal redemption for us? Because you could have done it on earth, but you couldn't do it in heaven. Oh, praise the Lord. And only in the resurrected body of Jesus could he approach the holies and present this blood 
so that there could be for us, he could obtain for us what? Eternal redemption. Well, praise the Lord. And so the Palm, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So the Palm Sunday story is so important because it was part of the fulfillment of prophecy that will happen. That indeed, that those who were alive at a time should have known that indeed this was what was prophesied that will happen. Come with me to Daniel chapter 9. This is like a Bible study this morning, and it's okay. You all don't mind, do you? Daniel chapter 9. Yeah, I don't have any notes, and so we'll go everywhere, okay? <laughs> Daniel chapter 9. And let's start from verse 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. And you see the eternal redemption there? And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy which of course refers to Jesus. Next verse. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, in, in, the, um, in, 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 in when we talk about Weeks in the Bible, sometimes it refers to years. Amen. So you need to, you know, so we're not talking about just, just, uh, just weeks, okay? And so, and then it says, and three score and two weeks. Three score, three score is how many? 60, right? And two weeks makes what? 62 weeks. And so 62 weeks plus seven makes what? 69 weeks which could be 69 years. Would you follow? Amen. I hope I haven't lost anybody. Hello? Are you here? Yeah. Okay, let me know. My goodness. All right. <laughs> um, the this, this street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Next verse. And after three score and two weeks, which is what? Shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the world desolations are determined. Next verse. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is, of course, referring to the Antichrist. And, in, and so, listen to this. Jesus comes, and there are 62 weeks or 62 years. At the end thereof, you have, if you will, Seven more years, which would be 69, right? Now, there will be, there, there is a gap. I, I don't know. There's a gap between the years that Jesus manifests to the time when the final seven weeks would, would manifest, which would be seven years, Amen. right? There's a gap. And the gap is often believed to be the time that the church was established. And so when, during the time of, the, of, of this Palm Sunday, it was Palm Sunday to usher in you and I. To usher us into God's family. The excitement that people were having, declaring and throwing their, their clothes uh, their, uh, on, the, on, on the ground and, and, and shouting, blessed be the name of uh, blessed is he that come out in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When they were saying all of that, it was in preparation of giving birth to the church. Amen. And that is the eternal redemption that the scripture is talking about. It is only for the church. Even with the Jewish people who heard and saw this and never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, miss that. Amen. I get him here. And so the point that I'm making is this, that uh, if you read the account of Daniel and the account of what we read in Zechariah, God was preparing them to know that the day was coming when somebody will fulfill that. 
And the one who fulfills it will be the Messiah. Except that the problem they had is this, that they expected the Messiah to be a conquering king, not a suffering lamb. Did you get it? And because of that, they missed the visitation. Look at what Jesus said in, in, in uh, uh, Luke chapter 19. And let's pick up from verse 45. Luke 19, verse 45. This is what Jesus said. Luke 19, 45. Oh, go up a little. Go to verse 30. 30 go to verse 40. Let's start from verse 40. And uh, let's go up again. 38. I said, blessed, is, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, you see, and glory in the highest. Next verse. And some of the Pharisees, they heard what was being said, and the Pharisees were very, very religious people. I mean, Jesus said that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, that's when I entered the heaven. All because of that, they were students of the Bible. And when they heard what was being said in reference to the person who would be the Messiah, some of the Pharisees from among what you said unto him, Master, rebuke them. Tell them, tell your disciples not to say what they are saying, not to sing what they are singing, not to praise you the way they are praising you. Tell them about it. And what was the reason? Because they knew that that very declaration was in reference to the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. Right. The sad thing about it are people who will study the Bible, know the scriptures, but they don't have the heart to understand it. Amen. That's so sad. There are people who go to seminaries and divinity schools and Bible colleges, and they have the training and the teaching and understanding, they can quote the scriptures to you, but the, they have the letter, but not the spirit. And so these people could not see that this Jesus is the Messiah because they thought that he had to be born in Bethlehem and not only that, be the son of David, not only that, that he will be royalty, not only that, he will be a conquering king. They missed his first coming. Even though the scripture points out that somebody will come riding into Jerusalem on a colt. Whom they will say about it. Now, who was the one that even started singing the song, Blessed he, blessed is, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord? I believe that was an unctioning of the spirit of the living God. That the people in, in, in unison began to say that, began to sing that. Because listen to the next verse. It says, that, and he answered and said unto her, I tell you that, if they should hold their peace, the stones will immediately cry out. The stones will immediately, what? Cry out. Which means that, which means that this has to be fulfilled. And if stones have to fulfill it, so be it. Oh, glory be to God. There was something that had been put in place that, that's why the Bible says, not a jot nor tittle will pass away from the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not, but not a jot and a tittle. And, and the reason for that is, is that it is easier for heaven to pass away, the earth to pass away, than for one word of God not to come to pass. And so God says something to you, it will come to pass because he said it. Oh, praise the Lord. You, you miss some place to shout, hallelujah. It says, the moment this thing happens, the stones, if you stop them, if you tell them not to do it, even the very stones will immediately cry out. Why? Because it was the very season for the manifestation of the Messiah. It was the very season for the declaration of whom it is that will fulfill this particular scripture. Are you getting me here? And so when the time is ripe, when the time is ready to manifest anything that God has said to you, it will come to pass and nothing can stop it. Oh, praise the Lord. 
Now, let's go on. Next verse. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Next verse. Saying, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now, but, but, but now they are hid from thine eyes. You see that? It says that if thou hast known, even thou at least in this day, thy day, this very day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Next verse. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee and compass thee around and keep thee in, in on every side. Next verse. And shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of your visitation. There is a visitation that Palm Sunday was supposed to reveal to the children of Israel. And they missed their visitation. Don't miss yours. Don't miss when God is doing something. And I'm telling you, from, from, from all the signs that we see, we are really in the end times. And that there is time coming. The greatest event after the birth of, uh, and the death and the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the, the church being established on the day of Pentecost. The next greatest event for the whole world will be the rapture. And everything that we see down the road is pointing towards this end coming. And, and I'll share more with you down the road because I want you to see. I don't want you to be ignorant of the things that are happening. Not to be afraid of the things that are coming, but for you to equip yourself with the knowledge and say to yourself, our redemption draweth nigh. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, so the key is this, that there is a story behind Palm Sunday. There is an understanding that God wants you and I to have of Palm Sunday. And it is simply this, that if God makes a promise, if God declares a thing, that thing will come to pass, even if inanimate objects, even if, if stones will have to fulfill it, God will make it happen. Are you listening to me here? Now, let's go back to, to, uh, to Luke chapter 19, verse 38. It says, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I'll show you why it is the case that, that the announcement made with Jesus riding towards Jerusalem from Bethpage, that announcement or peace in heaven, I show you how in Hebrews it makes sense to believe that, that something had to happen in heaven to bring peace to it. Because listen, and, 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 and I'm going to say this very quickly and, 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 and we'll move on. This is what happened. When man sinned, that sin affected heaven. I'll show you why in a minute. Don't forget that and I, it, is, it did not affect the throne of God. I want you to understand that. But because the throne of God is really the mercy seat, the throne of grace, where everybody goes to receive pardon and mercy from. Praise the Lord. And so it still has to be holy. But there were vessels, there were uh, utensils, there were certain things in that area of what you might say, the temple in heaven, that were affected by a man's sin. And Jesus had to use his blood to sprinkle on those utensils and ultimately on the mercy seat asking for eternal redemption for all of us. Okay, let me take it Come with me to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16. And let's look at verse 16. This is a, it's difficult to preach a sermon like this on a Sunday morning. 
because you send the money and people want, you know. Bring it on. Bring it. Okay, but, but you got you to gotta get this. I just want you to, so that when Palm Sunday comes next year, you will understand how significant it is. Because it brought peace to heaven. It gave us an opportunity to, to understand that there is an eternal redemption that God had prepared and pre-planned for us so that we never should yield to any thought that we are not saved. Because when Jesus did it, he did it for an eternal redemption. Eternal is eternal. Eternal is forever. And somebody said, forever is forever. All right. And in, listen to this. Now, this is another thing that is important to know. When you study the Bible, uh, you get to understand that in the Old Testament, they were all shadows of what was going to happen. In fact, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, hold on to it. Oh, okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Praise the Lord. All right. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read a few of these and then we'll see. It says, Moreover, brethren, I will not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat the same uh, spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So what was happening amongst the Jewish people when they were leaving Egypt towards the promised land, the rock, the spiritual rock that followed them, the Bible says was what? The rock, of Christ, the rock that was Christ. And, and, and so you see here that in verse 6, go there. Now, these things were our examples. Did you see that? They were our examples, which is to say that there were shadows. That's a, another scripture that even points out that indeed uh, what we are referring to here as... Um, referring to here as examples, were shadows. A shadow meaning that they were things that showed what was going to happen, but the, the real thing hadn't shown up yet. Are you getting me here? When you see a, your shadow, when the sun is up and you see your shadow, the shadow is not the real you, right? It is to point out there is someone who is real, and so God was saying to them that this, uh, everything that in, in the Old Testament were shadows of things to come. And if had they understood that, it would have made a lot of difference in terms of the way they saw Jesus. Did you get me? Amen. Now, go back to Revelation. Um, what, what, where, 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 um, uh, Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. Verse, I said verse 16, right? Okay. Praise the Lord. Now, it says, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. So shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remained among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Next verse. This is in reference to the high priest doing this. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out. That's what Jesus said. You can't touch me until I have gone because what was happening, this here is a shadow of what really happened when Jesus showed up. And have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. In this case, for all of us, uh, uh, humanity. Next verse. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar roundabout. Next verse. 
and he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Anytime you see that as a shadow, you, it, it, it means not only for Israel now, but for the whole world, right? You, you, even though Jesus said salvation is for the Jew first. So, and, and yes, but if it's first, there's a second, there's a third, there's a fourth. Would you agree? Yes. All right, next verse. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So there are two goats now. If there's a live goat, there must be a dead goat somewhere. <laughs> now, I, I should have gone a little earlier to you put it. Okay, next verse. And the owner shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. And shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. I want you to get it now. There are two goats that are presented. And of those two goats, the high priest had to determine which one will be, uh, first of all, he had to determine they were acceptable. And after he determines that they were acceptable for sacrifice, then one of them, they, 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 they cast lots or he will cast lots and decide which one will be the live goat and which one will be the, the sacrificial goat. The sacrificial goat is, is killed and its blood is what he takes and goes into the Holy of Holies. Right? So we know that. Now he's talking about the live goat, what happens to the live goat. What I want you to see is this. If what we uh, read in the Old Testament is the shadow, then this, there has to be an instance where if Jesus is the Passover lamb, as, as Paul says, Christ our Passover lamb, then he has to meet the live goat and the sacrificial goat characteristics. That means that he has to both be killed and then both be sent out into the wilderness. Did you get here? He, you know, he has to be killed and be sent out. The wilderness simply is an uninhabited place where man, man does not have it in that place. When I was in Israel recently, they showed us where the wilderness is. It's just like a desert area, right? So the point is, is that the two goats, say two goats, one sacrificial, right? And the other one is a live goat. The sacrificial goat is killed. The blood of the sacrificial goat is used to make the, the vessels in the holy place uh, uh, cleanse, the, to cleanse it and to make it holy. Now, the live goat, on the other hand, according to the scripture, that he, the, the priest, will put his hands on the live goat and transfer upon an innocent goat the sins of the entire nation. Amen. But they don't kill this one. They send him into the wilderness by a fit man. Now, that means that you got to be good, strong enough to be able to go to the wilderness and come back home. And not only that, uh, there is something that is required, which is that you got to be able to not only, uh, you know, uh, release the goat but when you come back, they, they show you how you have to, you can't come into, into, into your house. You have to go outside the camp and bathe before you can come back in. Now, so, um, when I was reading this, was a boy, goodness. It's amazing how God plans things. Because he is pointing out to the children of Israel, listen, this Messiah, when he comes, yes, there's a conquering mission for him. That will happen in Revelation chapter 19. We'll go there if we have time. But for this time, he will be the sacrificial lamb as well as a live goat that is released into the wilderness. Because this is, it, it, this is what this is saying. But they missed it. Jesus said, you missed the day of the hour of your visitation. Because they were only looking for the omega. They weren't looking for the alpha. They were looking for the ending, not looking for the beginning. 
they miss the, the ending because they concentrate on the ending rather right, than concentrate on the beginning. Hello. And so here we are. Here we are. You're going to see this in a minute. Uh, this scripture says that the, the sins are released upon the head of the goat and shall send my way by the hand of the fit man into the wilderness. So Jesus had to meet this. Go with me to, um, to um, Isaiah 53. And let's look at verse 8. Isaiah 53, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation for him? He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken out of the land of living. And so where Jesus was going would be a place uninhabited by living people. Which is where? Hell. Did you get it? He had to be sent out to the land, not out, out of the land of the living. And hell is a place for those who are not in the land of the living. So obviously Jesus went to hell. We know that. I don't have the time to give you the scriptures for it. That he went there. Because in, in um, Isaiah, verse, verses 4 and 5, let's look at that. See, this takes the, 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 the live goat scenario here. Let's go to the sacrificial goat. Uh, go to verse 4 of the same chapter, Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Next verse. But he was wounded for our transgressions. You see that? He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, what? We are healed. He says he was wounded for our transgressions, for our sins. And we know that Jesus was the, sac the sacrificial lamb. Now, let me give you another quick example of that. Go with me to John chapter 11. And let's pick up in verse 41. John 11, 41. Uh, let me go quickly so we don't read the whole thing. John. John chapter 11, and let's start from verse 45. Now, this is where Lazarus is healed, is, is, is uh, raised from the dead, right? Then many of the, uh, yeah, many of the Jews, uh, I don't read the whole thing. Okay, let, let's start from there. So many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which is that they believed on him. Next verse. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Next verse. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. All right. Next. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Next. And one of them named Caiaphas, and I went to his house when I was in Jerusalem, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, you know nothing at all. Don't forget, it is the high priest who determines the uh, Passover lamb, determines what lamb is acceptable for sacrifice. When we read, God was telling Aaron, Aaron, this is what I want you to do. I want you to choose, I want you to select goats that are acceptable to me. They couldn't have a spotted goat with spots, you know. It has to be unspotted goat. And he has to examine the goat to make sure that there's no blemish, no spot, no wrinkle anyway. He has to determine that. And so here, Fast forward, remember the Old Testament is a shadow. Say shadow. shadow. Okay, and this is the real McCoy here. And so 
Caiaphas, who is a descendant of Aaron. You can only be a high priest if you come from Aaron's line. Who are you listening? And so, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that said me, I said unto them, you know nothing at all. Next verse. Now consider it is expedient for us. It is good for us that one man should die for the people. It is he who died for the people. One man. And that the whole nation perish not. They were talking about this Jesus. And he says, listen, one man should die for this nation. Whether he knew what he was saying or not, it is to fulfill prophecy. That it is a high priest who would determine who it is that qualifies to be the sacrificial lamb. Whew. Next verse. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, oh glory, that Jesus should die for that nation. Did you get it? Are you getting this? Are you getting this? And so you see here that the Caiaphas, the high priest, has not declared, Jesus, you it. All because of Palm Sunday and all because of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, that these things were coming to, uh, to, to fruition to the degree that, that it becomes clear that indeed for the scriptures to be fulfilled, God had prepared and paved the way for that to manifest. And I'm saying that any promise that he's made to us, he's paving the way for us to walk into the maturation and the manifestation of what he has promised us. That's how God is. He will lead you through mazes and other kinds of difficult curves and twists and turns. And before you know it, you are in the place where you're supposed to be all this time. So what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it around for good. Oh, praise the Lord. That is a Palm Sunday story. That God himself will see to it that everything that he had said. Don't forget, some of the promises that he makes to us, we didn't even ask him to. He just out of the counsel of his own will. In fact, hold on to this. Do I have time? Zero. <laughs> uh, oh, he's giving me one minute. Okay, good. <laughs> you, are, you are so kind. Um, and now I'm having a senior moment. I'm going to forget what I'm <laughs> Where was I going? Oh my God. Huh? Where was I going? You don't know where I was going? You don't know either because I didn't say it. Pastor, yeah, but I was going somewhere. It was so good. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me. Oh. Prophecy. Yes, he did. Ah, he did. Oh, my God, he did. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to go somewhere else. Let's have a minute. Uh, and it will come to me. C go, come, come to, uh, <laughs> come with me to uh, the book of uh, Luke again. Uh, let's go to Matthew this time. Matthew chapter 21. I don't receive a senior moment, okay, in Jesus' name. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, praise the Lord. Are you there in, 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 uh, in, in what I said, Matthew 21? Okay. It says in verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, who's in the highest. I want to take, give me two, three minutes and explain this to you about blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know that this is in reference to Jesus. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. 
But because you also are joined heirs with him. Yes. Are you a joint heir? Yes. There's whatever Jesus is, so are we. Oh, I know where I was going. Thank you, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Go, come with me to 1 John chapter 3. <laughs> 1 John chapter 3. Praise the Lord. I knew the Holy Ghost would show up. All right. First John chapter, chapter 3. Let's start from verse, verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Praise the Lord. Is Jesus the son of God? Yes. Are we the sons of God? Yes. Like Jesus is, so are we. Would you agree? Yes. So blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When you step out to go anywhere, you are going in the name of the Lord. So blessed are you. Yes. Blessed are you. Wherever you go, as a child of the living God, as a son of God, wherever you go, you are blessed because blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And I know you go in the name of the Lord. You come in the name of the, in the name of the Lord. And so you are truly one. Blessed, praise the Lord. Behold, what man of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the word knoweth us not, because he knew him not. Remember we read that their eyes have, they closed. Remember they couldn't see Jesus as who he was. And the people in the world today who feel the same, who, who are just exactly the same way. You know, I, I don't know whether you've seen this uh, uh, picture of Jerusalem where you see the top of the, of the, of the temple, the, uh, the mosque, what, what, golden dome they call it. Right? Do you know on top of it they have written on there that God has no son. God has no That's the Muslim uh, dome. That God has no son. And it is a very prominent piece in the whole, if you take a picture of Jerusalem, if you've seen it, that very building is central to everything because that's where the temple was supposed to be built. But with the, with the, is, well, anyway, I can't remember time. Uh, verse 2. I said, Behold, now are we the sons of God. He said, This is what God says, not what they are saying. They are saying that, that God has no son. And God is saying, No, you are my sons. Now are you the sons of God. And does not yet appear what shall, we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so your identity determines who you are, not your behavior. And your identity is that you are the son of God. You are the daughter of God. Wherever you go, blessed is he that cometh in or goeth in the name of the Lord. Well, why don't you go this week in the name of the Lord with your blessed selves. With your blessed selves. Go in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Well, shout hallelujah. Set up your feet. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, glory be to God. How you can make the word of God flesh to you.